Rachel Olson, the founder and the host of the Best Mom Products show and podcast. Today, I'll be talking with Dr. Tamara Monasoff, who is the founder and CEO of Mom Invented, a website where she has resources and programs to help you bring a product to market. When her daughter clogged their toilet with toilet paper, Tamara went out to look for a solution and couldn't find one, so she invented the TP Saver, a device that prevents babies and pets from unrolling it. That was her aha moment over 10 years ago. She now is a five-time author, most recently of the updated version of the Mom Inventor's Handbook, How to Turn Your Great Idea into the Next Big Thing. Today, I'm excited to be talking with her on what's changed in 10 years, what she's learned from helping entrepreneurs, and what it really takes to bring a product to market successfully. So, Tamara, it's nice to have you here. I'd love to get started. So nice to be with you. Thanks, Rachel. Since your first edition of this handbook 10 years ago, so much and so little has changed. What's the most influential change you've made? it's made to date? It is stunning what has changed. If, in the first edition, I was suggesting that people go to the yellow pages. <laughs> and my kids don't even know what the yellow pages are. So I, it's really amazing when I was looking at the book to see what needed to be changed, I realized the entire book needed to be rewritten. And I was actually really excited because I love technology and everything that it brings to us. I mean, think about it. We're talking right now, you know, from our homes. It's amazing. And so what's changed is uh, when I wrote the first edition, Google didn't exist, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, they were not, they didn't exist. I mean, it's hard to even imagine that now. And so because they're such useful tools for us as entrepreneurs. What thrills me about this book is not only have I shared every possible resource that I could, I know you read it, so I know you know it's true, and that, but also uh, the generosity from the entrepreneurs who are featured in this book has been phenomenal. They've shared their factories that they're, they're using right now. They're designers. They're prototype developers. I, I mean, in the first edition, we didn't have that kind of depth of resources. And now that people have had time to develop these relationships, now they're sharing so that other people can now just get started immediately with real resources. So it, it, it is just incredible. I've interviewed a lot of mom entrepreneurs and the ones that are bringing a physical product to market, even behind the scenes, people always share, I'm sure what they do with you too, way more than they'll necessarily share on video. And the biggest challenge is in manufacturing is nobody wants to share their manufacturer because it is very difficult. Everyone I've talked to has gone through two, maybe three manufacturers before they find one, still might be frustrated with the quality or, you know, there's always things that go wrong. So it's interesting that they're willing to share. Um, why do you think that they're open about that now? These entrepreneurs are at different stages who are featured in the book too. So I think that it's just, people are just being generous, which I am so grateful for. You know, the number one question that most people don't want to share because it's very personal to them when I interview, but you've now, you know, you've worked with so many entrepreneurs and seen this and gone through it yourself is really what is the expect, what is the cost to bring a product to market? And I understand that different products cost different things, but if you're really looking at, you know, doing a manufacturing run, having enough to do the market research and work with retailers, is there a certain number that comes to mind? really is such a vast range in cost. And I always tell people, don't spend a penny until you understand the process first, because I, I still do this now. Do I really need it? Is this essential to my business right now? And I always ask myself that question because sometimes you want to do the fun stuff. Like you want to, you know, do some fancy, you know, brochure or something. We don't really do brochures anymore, but you know, web page or something spectacular because that's the fun part. But really, it's about stepping back and being methodical in terms of your spending so you don't overspend and get yourself into a stressful situation. It's been a decade, so I've seen patterns over time. And essentially, people usually think that the very first step that they need to take is to go get a patent because they want to protect their idea. And I understand that thinking. However, that's not the case in terms of the best approach the best approach is to figure out if you have a viable business first and if there's actually a market for your product and if people are going to buy it. So the way to do this, and I dedicated two chapters to this, chapter one and chapter three are looking at the market in different ways. In the first one, it's understanding the big picture. What is the big picture? So if you have a pet item, there's 77 million households with pets in America. Okay, that's where people usually stop. They're like, ooh. If I just get a small percentage of that, I'm happy. 
But that's not good enough because you don't really know enough about those people and you don't know how they will respond to your product. So beyond the big picture, then you need to really get in and do your interviews, your informal focus groups, and you can make them fun, by the way. Everyone's like, oh my gosh, that's so scary, but it is really fun. And then also you can do surveys, and this is where you're actually asking people the questions. Is this something, is this a problem that you're experiencing? Is this something that you would purchase? If not, why not? What would you change? And if this was your product, how would you do it differently? Asking these types of questions, and how much would you pay for it? And that's the way you find out incredible information. In fact, I think that those are the golden gifts because that's people telling you the truth, especially beyond friends and family, I might add. You need to go beyond friends and family and really talk to people that you don't know. And for example, when I was creating my product 10 years ago, I did an informal focus group and I was stunned because one mother said, oh, my son could choke on that cap of my product. And that had never even crossed my mind. I was so focused in on how to make the thing that I wasn't incorporating safety into it as I do now teach now. And so I had to go back and thank goodness I hadn't already produced thousands of units. And I had to go back to the engineer and we had to create a safety cap. So these are the things you want to find out ahead of time before you spend money producing it and then having to go back and fix. So that's why market research is essential. Let me just say one more other quick thing. And that is that with if you go out and you get a patent first, essentially what will happen is once you make all those changes, let's say you get all this feedback afterwards and you say, oh my gosh, you know, this person said this, I have to do this, I have to do that. You've changed your product and invalidated your patent. So you'll have to pay money again to, to amend your patent. And so you're ending up spending thousands of more dollars. And so it's much more important to do this research first and find out, is this, is this going to make sense? And you'll also know in Chapter 3, it was about pricing. You, I help you figure out how to estimate your production cost because you need to know, is this thing going to be crazy expensive and then, and then consumers are not going to buy it? Or, hey, does my production cost work and I do have enough money left over for the retailer, for me, um, in order to create this great business? You know, once you decide that you've done your market research, you're bringing the product to market, you considered making the sale the most important chapter in your book. You say, no matter how you plan to approach a mass market outlet, outlet, realize that the timeline is going to be long. It could be a year or two or more before you get a decision or see your product on store shelves, and the answer could still be no. So it took you two years to get into an account with a distributor for the TP Saver, you say, who served grocery stores nationwide. I'll let you, you said it took you gently nudging about every three months. And when the distributor finally said yes, you started receiving weekly orders for 25,000 units at a time, which is incredible. The thing that's amazing about selling today are the options. It's not just, you know, some people think, oh, well, I have to just get into a retail or mass retail. There are so many different layers of sales opportunities that are have cropped up and it thrills me because it's so much easier today. And you're right, I called every week. And by the way, I gave those names of the distributors in the book. And those distributors you cannot find on Google. Amazing. And it took me two years to land those accounts and they are all in that book. So I just want you to know that I shared. Do they know that you shared it yet? <laughs> No, they're going to be really surprised. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Their phones are going to be going crazy. Um, what do you consider a gentle nudge? Because I have to say that no matter what you're doing, sales, PR, whoever you're following up with, you know, in today's day of like tweeting them or emailing them, people are so inundated. So what would a gentle nudge be? What's the best way to follow up? But I t really suggest people do is you create an email. These buyers, first of all, there are a couple of things. One is... Buyers have to fill up their shelves. That is their job. Okay, so I want people to understand from the buyer's perspective that they need you. <laughs> and so just have that in your mind when, because I know people get really nervous about contacting buyers. Also, I suggest that you send an email with an enticing subject heading like, you're, you know, you've sold 300 units in three hours or whatever, you know, through through one of the new sites that are in the book, like uh, Kids Steals or Zoo Lily, some of those quick, fast sales sites. 
And you, so those are the kinds of opportunities where you do can blow through a lot of units in a short period of time. So you put this subject heading because remember, speak money to these people. You, they want to have a products that are going to be successful, that are going to sell. So if you've had sales success, pop that right into your subject heading. Do a product demo, demo video and put that into the email and to have it be less than two minutes. One minute's even better, but just quick. Don't get into your whole story. Just show how this awesome product works. And they want everyone's visual. And you know, as YouTube is just skyrocketing, that people love to watch video. It's really hard to not click on the video, especially if you say that something's you know sold 300 units in three hours, kind of a thing. You want to know what it is. So create these kind of compelling emails, but then, oh, and you saw the sales script in the book. I teach you how to how to go through these steps, but don't make sure to put a follow up at the end. If I don't hear from, back from you in a week, I'm going to follow up with you next Wednesday and then do it. Follow up exactly when you say, because then they're like, oh, I can't just delete that. They're going to get, <laughs> they're coming back. <laughs> and when you get a buyer on the phone, first of all, they may not be the warmest individuals in the world because they're stressed. They're trying to make good decisions. They're busy, so don't take it personally. But if they say, okay, I'm going to look at it and I'll get back to you, don't just say, okay, great, bye. Instead, say, okay, fantastic. Can I follow up with you at this exact same time next week? And then you proactively do it instead of have them come to you. And so you get it right on the books before you let them go. Of all of the inventors that you've worked with, how many actually make it big and how do you define success? So this is an interesting question. I'm so glad you brought that up because I also define success is recognizing after you do your market research that this is not a viable product and you need to let it go. So success to me isn't just getting onto store shelves and selling wildly. Success is being smart about your choices, about making sure that you're choosing a product that makes sense. You know, my product was my third pro uh, third idea, not my first idea. And it's important. See, most people have their idea, they put their head down, they figure out how to make it, they bring it to market, and suddenly they've got thousands of units in their garage that they can't sell and they're scared to death. That's what I teach how not to do because if you go through this process and it is a process I mean you walk go through all these different steps to evaluate your product and make sure the pricing you all these pricing estimates really help you because it can help you figure out where you are otherwise it's just like all you know vague and you don't want it to be vague you want to be sure about what you're doing but when a student says to me, you know what, I've done, I've gone through this process, a couple things have happened. I've had students come to me and say, you know what, I'm so surprised because I just love this and I thought everybody would want it. And the feedback I got on my survey was really disheartening because people really don't want this. And I say, I know, I know that that's hard because I do. I know that that's hard. But guess what? Now you can open up an opportunity for something else. You can let in another idea. And then I think people say, well, I don't have another idea. I'll never have another idea again. Trust me, you will. Once you let go of one, another one will come in. And, and so anyway, to go back to your question, success is a whole range, whether it's letting go and moving on, or it's starting small and building up, and which is, of course, the what I suggest in the book, that you start small, build your way up, and then sometimes you have the big hits that happen, but that doesn't happen as often. So I see success in the whole continuum. Um, well, I appreciate you sharing all of this, um, Tamara. And I think that, you know, maybe we can end with one of your favorite quotes. My daughter just told me a quote yesterday. She's 10 and she was quoting uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson. And I thought, wow, <laughs> where did you read that? <laughs> She goes, Mom, I just love this quote. I'm like, wow, what is it? And she said, for every minute that you're angry, you lose 60 seconds of happiness. It is quite a process and a journey. And I think it really is the journey that we learn so much from. So I know we're trying to get to the end in terms of making our products and getting them out. But in fact, a lot of good can happen during that journey, not only learning, but you can learn a lot about yourself going through this process as well. And let me just add one more thing is that you can include your kids in this journey if you have kids. And I've done that with my children. And so I know a lot of parents feel guilty that they're working and they're trying to, you know, putting all this attention on their product uh, inventions or bringing their products to market. And in fact, 
kids love to be a part of all of this. And so I just wanted to share that because like my kids, I always put up new logo designs and they're telling me what they think. They were the first ones to scan those QR codes in this book and watch those videos. So, I mean, they're, if you weave them in and include them, they feel like it's their business too. Well, your insight and willingness to share all this will be well received by this audience, definitely. So it's a great book. And um, for our viewers and listeners, I'll include the link to her book in the show notes. And so if you enjoyed this interview, go sign up for our newsletter, leave us a positive review on the iTunes store podcast. That's how um, other people can help discover our podcast. So um, bestmomproducts.com and talk to you soon.